The French engineer who actually builds it is a guy called Ferdinand de Lesseps, who has a great I thought of it first row with another engineer. And his hero is yet another Suez Canal wannabe, who by the strangest coincidence has a couple of brothers here in Malta. And this third person also claims to have designed the canal. Name of Henry Saint-Simon, a curious character to say the least. At one point, Saint-Simon shoots himself in the head six times and survives. Then he invents a new version of the Catholic religion strictly for businessmen, and finally he comes up with a totally new scientific view of history. Now, Saint-Simon's secretary, a fellow called Auguste Comte, another loony, and the last, I promise, regards Saint-Simon as a kind of world-class genius, the guru of all time. Speaking of which, India. Now, Auguste Comte never actually visited India. He married a hooker and lived unhappily ever after. But India illustrates Comte's ideas rather well. Well, that's my excuse. And now for his world-changing contribution to science. Comte follows up on Saint-Simon's scientific view of history. Look around you, he says, at uh, museums and such, which we don't have to because what Comte is talking about is all around you here in India. And you see that humanity's gone through three historical stages. To start with, we all go through the theological stage, with this kind of stuff. Gods and spirits and other such supernatural mumbo-jumbo, says Comte. That's the first of the three stages of development. The second is what he calls the metaphysical stage, the half-theological stage, when people discover how to harness the basic forces of nature, like steam power, for instance, or gravity, electricity, or magnetism, with some form of God kind of pulling the levers behind the scenes. And finally, says Comte, we get to the scientific stage. No mumbo-jumbo, no hobgoblins, no deities writing the laws of nature, just rational, scientific observation of how all the bits of the world fit together. The thing is, back at the theological stage of development, there's no way people can be scientific. There are no instruments that you would call instruments. And since nobody believes in stuff like natural laws that can be investigated, there aren't. And they don't. At the metaphysical stage of steam power and such, they just don't have the science to find out what the mystery forces of nature actually are, so they leave that side of things to God. On humanity's great journey from the past, says Comte, all you can ever say is people at different times see things differently. And he clinches that argument like this. The ultimate science has to be a science that looks at the individual view that each individual has and at how all the individual views add up to how a society works at any one time. So the ultimate science has to be the science of human behavior, which Kant invents and calls sociology. And he says, when you're looking at how a person functions, all you can go on is their view of the world, and that depends on their point of view. There are no absolutes. On the subject of absolutes, Buddhism's all about that. You know, no absolutes. No center to the universe. Nothing but... Uh, Nothingness? Buddhism is attractive to the guy who takes over from Kant, because Buddhism represents a point of view that kind of says there's no point of view. The fellow who turns that into a science is the professor of physics at the University of Vienna in 1895. Ernst Mach, famous for his popular science lectures. One of which is not a million miles from what these shows are all about, the accidental nature of discovery. Anyway, Bach takes Kant's ideas to their logical conclusion.
First of all, Mach looked at how you view the world from a sensory point of view, by whirling people around blindfold and seeing what that does to them. <laughs> then Mach decided to take on bigger things, like how you view the entire universe. Take Newton's apple, for instance. Say you drop the apple. OK, no problem. Here it is, falling. Except, due to the fact that the Earth spins as it travels in space, the apple's really going this way. Unless, that is, the solar system happens to be turning like this, as it travels through space, so that the apple's doing this. Mind you, if our galaxy's turning, then the apple's really turning. Unless our local section of the cosmos is going this way, in which case that's what the apple's doing. Unless the universe is expanding and contracting. So, unless you know your frame of reference, you can't say the apple's falling. Or say anything. You see the Buddhist connection. Without a frame of reference, all you get is the local effect, which is no use to anybody. Certainly not the hard heads in science. So Mach comes up with a view of how to view that somebody else calls Mach's principle. And it says, everything in the cosmos is affected by everything else. Which means that anything you ever experience is going to be strictly relative. You've already guessed, I'm sure, who the somebody else is. The most famous scientist ever who writes Mach's obituary and who says all physicists get Mach in their mother's milk and who turns all this philosophy and science and history and stuff I've been on about into an idea that you could say puts the totality of only everything, everywhere, into an entirely new light. Albert Einstein's the name. Relativity is the game. See, Einstein reckons that if everything in the cosmos is affected by everything else, then that should include everything, including light. Which Einstein reckons is affected by gravity. Now there's only one way to check that. So on May the 29th, 1919, they do. With this. An eclipse. Here's the partial eclipse track, and here's the total eclipse track. So here, on Prince's Island, they photograph the moment of total eclipse when, because of the darkness, the stars are visible in the sky. Now, earlier on, they've taken a shot of the same stars when the sun wasn't in the sky. Look, here's a couple, see? Printed black on white to make them easier to make out. Now, here comes the incredibly minute bit of detail that so often changes the course of history. They come back from Prince's Island with this photograph. Remember, it's all black on white. There's the eclipse sun, and there's those two same stars. Now, because everything's so incredibly small, you blow those pictures up 300 times, and you get this. Here's one of the stars when the sun wasn't in that bit of the sky. And here's the same star when the sun was there. See that tiny shift? That's because in the eclipse photos, the light from the star is coming past the sun and being bent by the sun's gravity. So the star position seems to change. Thanks to that minute displacement, everything in existence has changed. Well, that's it. Thanks to the Smithsonian and sonar, welding, ash from seaweed, interchangeable parts for clocks, the world of opera, gurus, and Einstein's theory of the gravity effect, we've come from the light of knowledge to the knowledge of light. Because of which, it's Einstein's universe now, not Newton's anymore. So you can drop the apple. <laughs>